Hello and welcome to Northeast Christian Church online service. We are so happy to have you with us. Please be sure to follow NECC on all social media platforms. And to listen to all our past messages, follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the service. and the sacrifice of your time we just give it all to God and we say we put all that other stuff in our mind away we say father we're here for you we make this sacrifice of our time or of attention and we minister to you father holy spirit come be in this building with us let's worship together
Shake the mountains, break the walls apart, open the heavens, almighty God you are, overcomer, defender of my heart. And by your power, the oceans open wide, your fire falls down, heaven forever by my side you shake the mountains shake the mountains break the walls apart open the heavens almighty god you are overcomer defender
Across this room, we lift up our hands, we lift up our hearts. We just say to you that we will run the race. We will finish the course. We will run the race that you have set out before us. And Paul the Apostle said that and said, there is in store for me a crown of glory. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would not be the God of our Sunday and you would not just be the God of our sin, but you would be Christ alone. You would be our all in all. And Father, I just thank you for a community of people, Lord Jesus, who when they sing loud and they jump high, that they walk straight when they land and they walk their faith out in their place of work and they deal with people with civility and love and they, they handle themselves like Jesus. I just thank you for what you have built here. And I just thank you today for who you are in our lives, Lord. We give you all the glory. We pray today that the word that's spoken will challenge us to raise the bar in our life. That, Lord, that, that we would have a raising of excitement in our life of what it is to pursue Jesus. And we would understand the relevance that you are everything and that you want to be a part of everything in our life. We give you glory and praise in Christ's name. Amen. It's nice to be home. It's nice to be back.
Yes, thank you. I just want to, from the bottom of my heart, it, it would just be so much easier for me just to say thank you to all of you, whether you uh, reached out with a phone call or a card, and some of you were just crazy enough to drive to uh, the wake and the funeral or one or the other, and some of you even showed up for both, but I just want to say thank you. I have to, my father, uh, if you were to look at his life, uh, you couldn't measure it in money. You wouldn't be impressed that way. And you couldn't measure it in degrees. Uh, he didn't have many. But what he did have is something that's in very short supply in the day that we live, and that's character. And my father is a hero to me because he's like Captain America without the shield. He was a man of character. He said what he meant. He did what he said. He did what was right, and he was willing to take a hit, even if it was easier for him to hit back because it wasn't the right thing to do. He was a man of character, and I just, uh, I won't, here's, here's the thing for me. Um, everybody says you don't know what it's like to lose a parent until you lose a parent, and I, I finally get that now. Um, but I would call my father every day on the way into work, every day. Uh, I, I cannot identify with a father I don't know, with a father who was angry with me, with a father who was disappointed with me. I can't identify with a father who put unrealistic driving expectations on me. The one thing that my father said to me every time I saw him was, I love you and I'm proud of you. And I understand God's uncondition, uh, unconditional love because of a father that did his best. And so... Um, as we kind of go through this as a family, this, this season of mourning, I just want you to know, if you see me cry, I'm not broken. I'm actually proud. I just miss the idea that I don't have somebody that close in my life still that has that kind of example. I said uh, all I need to say on that, but I just want to say thank you. And I appreciate it. And some of you have called, and I haven't been quick to call back. I, I just, it's just been a bit emotionally exhausting for me. And you guys, I'm sure any of you have suffered loss. You, you get that. But I know that you got, you are with me. And uh, there were so many uh, who represented the whole. Those, not everybody could drive down there, but those that drove down there said, Pastor, we're all with you. Those that called just said, we're, we're all for you. And uh, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And so uh, with, with that, I want you to know my father would want me to do this. Is instead of stopping the story, to turn the page, continue reading, and to let the next story begin. And, and, uh, and that's what I'm going to do. I, I live my life for an audience of one, my heavenly father. And I really never... Thanks to the confidence my father put in me, put much stock in other people's negative opinion of myself because I know who I am and I know in whom I have believed. And let me tell you what, whether you had the privilege of what I just expressed in a father like that or not, I want you to know Jesus is that man. He is not in heaven criticizing you. He is not disappointed by you. He's actually there looking at you saying, that's my son, that's my daughter, and I love them, and I'm well pleased with them. Hear the words of God to Jesus from your heavenly Father to you. This is my son, this is my daughter, with whom I am well pleased. Faults and all. So, Father, we just thank you. There's so much um, in this life that can cause grief, but grief is not a bad thing. It's actually there. You say in your word, it's biblical. There is a time to grieve. There's a time to be bargaining and, and there's a time to be in denial and there's a time where we're angry even. There's a time where we're depressed, but there comes a moment where we accept things and we're better for it. And so, Lord, I just pray for any form of grief along with mine that you would just help us to do it in a healthy way. In Christ's name. Now, last week when I was here, or when I wasn't here, I was here actually, I was watching online the whole time. 
So I was watching what you were texting. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was watching online, and that's so how much I love this place. You know, forget Stephen Furtick and, you know, all those guys. Like, I was watching here and was so proud. Kristen Hodge, are you here? Is she here? She's not. She's, she's not here today. But uh, what a great job she did. The power of touch. COVID stole that from us, man. Like, it's time that we take back. Like, all right, I know, um, you know, we don't want to catch the flu and we don't want to catch that. But, man, Jesus was a, a God of touch. And uh, we, need to, we need to restore that to the kingdom and be able to put our hand on people's shoulders and lay hands on people and pray for them. And I thought that that was beautiful. But I, I, I'm going to give a spoiler alert. We're going to have them share it at, a, at another moment. But while we were going through that whole journey, um, we had several stories of cancer. But one of them by one of our members uh, was going through that. And uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have her share this publicly soon. But... There were spots of, of cancer in different organs. There was a large portion of cancer in their intestine. The doctor was saying we gotta give chemotherapy and we need to, to, you know, but we can't because it's too important to remove the section of their, the section that was completely filled with the tumor from the intestine. So they did that and they came back, listen, they came back and they said, you do not need any chemotherapy. We do not see any spots. We do not see any cancer. Now, now understand something in this church. Like I have some of you come up to me like, oh, pastor, I've had backaches for years, but the Lord set me free. We give testimonies that are medically documented. You know why? Because it means something when a physician says it was there and now it's gone, and we don't know how. And that's what happened after Kristen preached on Jesus praying and healing for people. Amen? So we're going I'm, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna just not pull that person on the spot or anything like that, but that was too good for me to keep to myself. So in the midst of what God's doing, God is, God is a healing. Listen, those of you under the age of 18, hear this. I'm so... I, I, I didn't grow up with urban legends of people who, you know, saw somebody that knew someone that walked. You're in a church where someone who had cancer and they no longer have cancer and the doctors say they don't know how. Don't you forget that. Don't you forget that. And so with that in mind, every single one of you uh, that are in youth ministry, I'm going to kick you out of here so you can hang out with Pastor Kev upstairs. Let's just give them a shout of appreciation. Thanks so much, Pastor Kev, for doing such a great job with the young people. And at this time, I'm going to hand this over, I think, to Pastor Dylan. Here he is, the man, the myth, the legend. I'll be sharing next week, uh, but I just needed one more week to settle into things. Didn't you appreciate this man of God? <laughs> behind, every, behind every man, there's a great woman, and I just want you to know that secretly you didn't know this but his wife writes all of his messages <laughs> uh, no comment <laughs> well I just want to say welcome to each and every one of you um, and if you are new a special welcome to you I invite you to fill out one of those cards in front of you and see me after service at the welcome desk I'd love to say hello meet you give you a gift uh, also, just a brief announcement before we move forward with our service today. Uh, with Jacob's Well, our outreach is uh, postponed due to the rain, so that will not be happening today. Um, so, just a word to those of you who are a part of that. And finally, before I jump into the word, I do want to thank each and every one of you who make giving a priority in this church. Uh, because you give, we can do the things that we do, like Jacob's Well, that provide help to those who need it. Uh, just this week, I... Um, received a call from somebody who's like, I just have this person on my heart and I want to bless them and I, I know that this would be a benefit to them. And it just brought joy to my heart to know that I get to be a part of a church that doesn't just keep stuff for themselves, but that cares about other people around them. And so 
I hope that you have that same spirit in you today. That God has blessed you, not so that you could build bigger barns and bigger bank accounts and bigger careers, but God has blessed you, like he said to Abraham, to be a blessing to others. And so I'm going to pray for our offering, and I ask that you would keep that generous spirit within your heart. You can give by these lock boxes here. You can give by hitting the give button. If you're joining us online, you can type in ne-cc.org backslash give, and you can also text the keyword N-E-C-C to 97,000. So let's pray. Father, thank you that you didn't withhold anything from us, and so we withhold nothing from you. And we ask that you would continue to help us to be generous and to love others, not just with our words, but with our actions. God, I pray that you'd multiply and bless everything that we offer to you in thanks. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for making me sound extra spiritual, Mary Evelyn. Great work. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm eager to share God's word with you again today, and I'm very grateful that Pastor Paul has entrusted this to me for so many uh, weeks in a row. But before I do today, I want to make one last call for baptism. Uh, Next week in service, we'll be baptizing eight people, uh, five adults and three kids. That's something to celebrate. Um, Yeah, yeah. You know, when I, I walked in this morning, I thought I was only baptizing six people and then two more came, and so my hope is that putting it out to you, you'd understand this. Baptism is not a final step in following Jesus. It's a first step in following Jesus, which means what? You don't have to have your life all together to come to Jesus. Thank God we don't. It's a step that we get to take and say, God, I'm offering my life to you, and so if you haven't been baptized, or maybe you've walked away from the Lord for a long time, and you want to recommit your life to Jesus, talk to me after service, and I would love to see just a couple more. I'd love to baptize 10 people instead of eight this week, uh, this coming week. So please, make that step. Let us celebrate that with you. Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. It's perhaps a familiar passage to some of you, but it's one I've been chewing over for quite some time. I've been reflecting on the writings and thoughts of a man named Diedrich Bonhoeffer over the last month or so. Some of you maybe have heard of him. I'm taking a class in the fall uh, called The Life and Theology of Diedrich Bonhoeffer. He's perhaps most famous for his statements about what he called cheap grace in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, which was published in 1937. In that book, he said this, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And he lived out those words in real time. And he gave his life preaching opposition to the Nazi party's extermination of the Jewish people. Being that we're coming up on a baptism Sunday, I thought it'd be appropriate to focus on what Jesus says it will cost to follow him and what a step like baptism actually means. You see, grace leads us to steps of obedience. It doesn't avoid them. It conforms us to the image of Christ, to the image of God. That's what grace does. You'll notice in your Bibles, if you turn to Luke 14, there's a a heading over verse 25, over this chunk of text, especially if you read the English Standard Version, which we prefer to read in this church. Uh, It's titled, The Cost of Discipleship. Now, those words are never said by Christ, but they're the essence of what he's talking about here. Today, we'll answer the question, What does it cost to follow Jesus? And as much as I share this message with you, I am preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to any one of you, because discipleship is not something you do that I've completed. Discipleship is something that you and I walk through together. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Let's read it together. We'll jump in. It's in Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 33. You can follow along with me, you can listen to me, you can read along in your own Bible, or you can just read the screen. It'll be up there for you. So let's read together 
Father, bless your word. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down and first deliberate, whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Father, I pray that today you would open the eyes of our hearts to see wondrous things out of your law. God, I pray that today you would create life where there is none, that you would create joy to follow where there's only fear, And God, I pray that you would transform our hearts and minds to become like your son Jesus in every way. That's my prayer for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Obedience has always been a bad word to humanity. We don't like it very much. However, it's essential to understand if you want to see what our faith is all about. Uh, The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, at the start of arguably his greatest letter in history, in verse 5, the reason I've been given grace, pay attention to that really close, what's the reason Paul's been given grace? It says, the reason I've been given grace is to bring about the obedience that comes from faith. Why is grace given to us? To bring about obedience. Real faith, leads to real change. Now, it's not the action that earns God's acceptance. Pay attention to that. Notice what comes first. Grace comes first. But real grace always leads to real obedience. And that has never been a winning strategy for church growth. (laughs) But it's always been a winning strategy to create real disciples of Jesus. When I first became a Christian, I was melted by how good God was. I couldn't get enough. I was constantly reading the Bible and praying. It was all Gucci and all grace until I realized that God might actually ask me to do stuff. I can remember I was a young Christian. I'd constantly be at church to help my pastor clean the church, mow the lawn, whatever was needed. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod. You can do that. And I saw this guy walking by the church. And the church was in a not-so-great part of town. And I felt the Spirit nudge me, go talk to him about me. And I couldn't shake that feeling, but my heart just started to sink because I was too scared, and I couldn't do it. I failed to act. And by the time I left the church that evening, even though I'd I'd vacuumed the sanctuary and mowed the lawn. It was dark, and I was feeling despondent. And I had to stop at a gas station before I went home, and right before the gas station, I saw this homeless guy walking, and I thought, here's my chance. I can help somebody. And so after I got gas, I did a U-turn, I pulled up to him, and I said, do you need a ride, bro? I was excited to maybe redeem myself. And he took off running as fast as a gazelle. I mean, he was gone into the bushes, just disappeared into the night. (laughs) In my desire to listen to God to help people, my zeal caused me maybe to miss the mark a little bit. Uh, Not long after that, I was pulled over by a police officer because one of my lights was out. And I I was just exploding with eagerness for Jesus. And so I said to the officer as I took my fix-it ticket, Officer, is there anything you need prayer for? (laughs) He said, no thanks, get your car fixed. (laughs) (laughs) You see, I didn't care how foolish I looked. 
I just wanted to show other people the same God who had forgiven me. And I messed up a lot. But I don't think God was upset or disappointed by that. Those are the kind of foolish disciples he's interested in creating, the kind who obey him, and when they fail to, they're eager to grow, the kind that let grace not only forgive them, but transform them. Listen to verse 25 for a second. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned to speak to them. It would be easy to pass up the context in which Jesus says what he's about to say. He's at the top of his game. He's not near the crucifixion. He's popular. People are flocking to hear him. It it would be like saying this. Jesus stood up on Easter Sunday to give a sermon. And this is the time when Jesus has them eating out of his palm, where he can really reward all these people for coming out. And this is what we're tempted to do when the great crowds gather. We feel we've succeeded. We feel we've reached the mark. When many people come and listen to the gospel, ministry success, after all, is measured by the number of people in the room, isn't it? Jesus seems to have assembled what many pastors dream of, the multitudes. And if anyone could have kept them coming week after week, it was Pastor Jesus. He could heal diseases. He could make the blind see. He could heal cancer. I mean, that's a pretty winning strategy for church growth to keep people coming back. And so the Son of God, with all power available to him, with the great crowds assembled to hear him, says the following. In verse 26 and 27, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wow. (laughs) Just inspiring words from Pastor Jesus. A potential parallel to this event happens in John chapter 6, where Jesus sees a great crowd, and he says a really hard saying to them. And later in verse 60, the disciples say, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And Jesus rebukes them in verse 63 and says, are you offended by this? Let me tell you, these words that I just spoke to you are spirit and life. And after this, the Bible says, many turn back from following Jesus. Ouch. I mean, Pastor Jesus seems like he made a mistake here. Uh, this, This is what the church growth strategies say that you should maybe talk about in small groups. This isn't the message for the big day. This is, this is what you give people once they've already signed the agreement. You slip it in there. You kind of, this is what you talk to people about in small groups, not on Easter Sunday. When I read Jesus telling crowds that they must hate their father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and even their own life, I'm tempted to explain it away or qualify it. Many of you from more collectivist cultures understand how radical this statement is, especially in cultures where family is everything. But Jesus' message runs counter not only to church growth strategies, but also to the human heart. You see, we want to have our cake and we want to eat it too. At the baseline of our human nature, we're trying to negotiate terms with God. We think, if I give this much, if I do this stuff, then God really can't complain that I haven't gone far enough. Most of us want to justify spending more on things like pet food than international missions. We want to deceive ourselves into thinking that we can have peace with God without surrendering our right to self-determination, and that is a lie. There's no such thing as making Jesus your Savior and not your Lord. And so what does Jesus mean here? What does Jesus mean that you have to hate? Doesn't that sound a little unlike Jesus and a little unlike what the rest of the Bible's told us? Doesn't that seem a little counter to what we're told? What Jesus is saying here is, if your love for me 
doesn't so eclipse the other loves that are in your life, then you don't understand what it means to follow me, and you are unable to do it. And that just doesn't mean abstaining from the bad stuff, by the way. It means reprioritizing the good stuff. Notice, Jesus makes no mention here to the crowds of stuff like adultery, angry outbursts, racism, gossip, slander, you know, the big things that you and I hold are degrading our society. doesn't mention them. Because it's way easier to make good stuff into an idol than it is bad stuff. You see, adultery is obvious, but greed isn't. In our society, we call it industriousness. Addiction's clear, but apathetic faith isn't. In our world, we call that balance. Paul the Apostle echoes Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 and 30. He says, this is what I mean, brothers and sisters, because the end is near. From now on, let those who are married live as if they were not those who mourn as though they didn't, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as if they had no goods. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we get to ignore our spouses, pretend we have no emotions, and not care about our business and career? No, it doesn't mean that, because you're not an amoeba, and you can't do that. But what Paul and Jesus are saying is, your human tendency is to put way too much stock in the here and now. And if you're not deliberate about it, you'll begin to make good things ultimate things, and that's called idolatry. That's Jesus' message to the big crowds. (laughs) That's Jesus' holiday sermon. And he continues the sermon later on with even more good stuff. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Your balance. It costs your carefully constructed and negotiated, balanced terms with God, where you've set the boundaries, and perhaps not said verbally to God, God, I'll give you this, but not that. I'll give you this much, but no more. You can tell me what to do over here, but not over here. And that's the message Jesus gives to the excited, assembled crowds, your two balance. You can tell because you might feel really in control of your time, your family, your life, your money, your career, even your faith. The big important things in your life are yours and God can't have them. What if God calls one of your children to be a missionary? What if he calls you? Would you support them, or would you surrender both opportunities and and business or career? What if God called you to give more than you think so that other people could be sent? What if God calls you to sacrifice your Saturday mornings or Sunday afternoons to serve with Jacob's well? What if you didn't get to decide all the parameters within yourself? You can tell when you've made good things ultimate things, when your sense of peace, identity, and security come from them instead of your relation to Christ. And thus we set down our cross and we pick up a tasty pina colada. But Jesus said, whoever will not bear their cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And he says that not in the context of walking away from bad things or sin, He says that in the context of walking away from good things. That should change the way you think about what it means to bear a cross. Because you see, the evil in our hearts does not primarily come from what's evil or doing wrong. It's a sin of omission. It's failing to cherish and love that what's good and being willing to do anything for God. That's a much harder thing to do. And that's at the heart of of discipleship, where you're not just willing to give God 10% of your money, 10% of your life to get him off your back, but where you say, God, it all belongs to you. That's what Jesus tells the crowd they have to be willing to do, to put down their comfort and pick up their cross. Timothy Keller, one of my favorite preachers, said, idolatry is not just a failure to obey God, it's a setting of the whole heart on something besides God. 
And another teacher named Michael Horton once said, the problem with idolatry is that it's an attempt to domesticate God, to reduce him to our manageable little deities we can control and manipulate for our own benefit. What does it cost to follow Jesus, your balance? I disdain that word because it implicitly, under the radar, tries to make the claim that we get to tell God when enough is enough. But like the Apostle Paul, I hope that our goal this morning is to let grace bring about obedience in our lives. Because even if it feels awkward or stretched, even if you mess it up, even if it feels over the top, I hope we're willing to make fools of ourselves in order to love God. I hope that our love for God eclipses other loves in our lives because you and I are in far more danger of loving God too little than you are in loving God with an overzealous spirit. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Your balance. In verses 28 and 30, Jesus continues his wonderfully inspiring sermon to the masses. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Last week, like Pastor Paul mentioned, Kristen Hodge preached a great message on the fact that God uses ordinary people like you and I to do extraordinary work. And I mean, it was a great altar time, great response. I mean, before the musicians even started, people were coming. I encourage you to go listen to it. But I often find it's not that most of us don't believe God could use us, it's that we prefer he wouldn't. Because then at least our inability would serve as a legitimate excuse not to carry out the will of God. We'd have a real objection. Moses tried this, right? When when God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh and speak to him, what's Pharaoh's response? I'm not eloquent enough. I'm unable to do it. Uh, Charles Stanley, who's a famous Southern Baptist leader I used to listen to quite a bit when I was younger, Um, He passed away this week at 90 years old. He was a pastor for 50 years, and he said this, If God tells you to run your head through a brick wall, then you run full speed and trust him to provide the whole. Obey God and leave all the consequences to him. Anybody signing up for that? (laughs) You see, whether or not it's your inability standing in your way or something else entirely, we find all sorts of reasons to be half-hearted in our commitment to Christ. And I find that the reason that there's not more ordinary people like us serving Jesus is simply because we'd prefer not to. We'd like a quiet faith, one that allows us to enjoy the full benefits of the American dream with little interruption or imposition on God's part and maximum benefit to us. Miroslav Volf, who is a professor of theology at Yale University, in his new book, Life Worth Living, it just came out last month, it was number one seller on Amazon, I encourage you to pick it up, but he says this, he calls this idea the Walgreens vision of life. Uh, this Walgreens uh, statement, their advertising statement, used to be, we live at the corner of happy and healthy. And he says, we adopt that vision for life when we determine that our lives Our goal is meant to be happy, healthy, and long. And doesn't that sound good to everybody? I mean, is there anybody here who wants to sign up for a life that's sad, sickly, and short? Do we have any takers on that one? I don't think so. But if you're investing all your resources in maximizing your pleasure in this life, you won't have enough resources to finish the race. You won't finish the tower if your whole heart isn't in it. That's Jesus' goal. Not converts who start, but disciples who finish. And he says that up front to the crowds. I was at the gym the other day, quite unwillingly, and uh, Monica wanted to go to the gym really bad when I got home. Marriage is about compromise, etc., etc. I ended up at the gym. Okay? (laughs) 
And I was running on a treadmill. Uh, I'd planned to run a mile, because Monica and I are training to run a 5K on Thanksgiving. Let me rephrase that. Monica runs half marathons. I'm training to run a 5K on Thanksgiving morning. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, it's called the uh, Feaster 5. 10,000 people in Andover, Massachusetts, largest 5K in the state on that day, but I was feeling lazy. And about a half mile in, my heart says, that's enough. You came, you satisfied your wife, you, you did what you needed to do, just hit that button. And with my hand hovering over the stop button, I heard the still small voice say, no, you need to finish this. And so I pushed and I pushed and I pushed, and I ran a mile and a half. Now that's no, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Now, that, that's no great accomplishment, especially to those of you tapped in the head who run 100 mile races. I'm looking at you, Alex. <laughs> but you have to count the small victories. Discipleship is like that. You could very well look at your life and say, I've done enough. I've ran enough. I've given enough. I've served enough, I've sacrificed enough. And it's easy to start thinking that way when you lose sight of the fact that God is worth it no matter the cost. Is your tower unfinished? And sure, no one notices. The walls look really good from the outside. Nobody's ever going to call you on it. You showed up to the gym. You satisfied the spouse. You did what you had to do. You can stop asking Jesus to use you. You can stop offering yourself to God. And on the outside, no one notices, and you look like a normal church-going person who listens to fantastic sermons on a Sunday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll pay you later, Emily. Thank you. But you see, what the person doesn't notice standing on the pavement below, looking up at your tower, they only see the nice walls, the polished stone, but what they don't see is your tower has no roof. Only heaven sees that. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Your half-hearted religion. Jesus doesn't want half disciples, he wants whole disciples, even if that means the crowd thins out. God doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. That's why he compares this thing to a marriage. It's a total, complete commitment. Right before Jesus gives this talk to the crowds in Luke chapter 14, he tells two pairs, or I'm sorry, one pair of these two parables, and they're both about a banquet. And in that parable, there's these peace people who keep making excuses why they can't come to the banquet. One says, I bought property, I have to attend to it. Another one says, I bought oxen, I have to attend to them. Another says, I just got married, I, I can't come. And those were all legitimate excuses. If you read the Old Testament, if you're just married, guess what you get out of? War. You see, you will always have legitimate excuses. And finally, the great man invites all the homeless, the blind, the poor, the crippled, those who could never afford to come to the banquet and never repay him, and says, none of those who were invited will taste my banquet. You see, if you hear God calling you today, then today is the day to answer. Don't put it off until tomorrow. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. And there will always be that reason to not give yourself completely to Jesus today. But if you heed that call, then you will find a more satisfying life than one that is simply happy, healthy, long, and empty. Because the most satisfying life of all is when you give yourself to Jesus completely. Because if happy, healthy, and long are the standards at which we're aiming, then Jesus failed miserably because his life was short and sorrowful, and he was called man of sorrows. But if giving yourself completely to God leads to satisfaction, then it's the greatest exchange you could ever do. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Half-hearted religion. And Jesus continues his last bit of his sermon in verses 31 to 33. 
Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes with 20? And if not, while the other's a great way off, he'll send a delegation asking for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Lastly, Jesus uses this very strange analogy about war, especially to our modern ears. We don't quite get this. We're uncomfortable when we look at it closely. It pictures God as a conquering king. And Jesus is implicitly saying, if God has come to be your king, you have to renounce everything as tribute. That's what happened in those days. If you lost a war and were conquered, you paid tribute. Pastor Paul has mentioned this before, but on the side of the Roman Colosseum, you can see the leftover uh, pegs that spell out the words, paid for with the Jewish temple tax. Because shortly after the time of Jesus, the Jews revolt. They're put down by the Romans. And instead of stopping paying the temple tax, because now the temple's gone, the Romans say, you pay it to us now. We're going to build a theater with it, and you're going to compete for your life with that theater. That was the consequence. That's the image Jesus uses in a world that is all too familiar with the consequences of losing a war. Now, as most of you know, I'm a complete nerd, and uh, growing up, my favorite video games were these military strategy games. Um, In particular, I always loved the game Rome, Total War, and uh, it's about as awesome as it sounds. It's every little boy's fantasy, all right? You get to conquer the world as the Roman Empire. It's, It's pretty sweet. But while I'm playing these games, my mom made me go to Sunday school occasionally, maybe once or twice a year. And it's usually around the holidays time when the Romans are featured during Jesus' execution. Except I felt like a really bad kid because I always thought that the Romans were cooler than Jesus. They had big shields and swords and shining helmets and they controlled the world. And Jesus and his disciples were like hairy hippie looking guys that talked about joy, peace, and, and brotherly love. And that was the world that Jesus lived in. A world dominated by Rome. It meant very best case scenario, you paid tribute, and very worst case, you lost your life or your land. And with the assembled crowd on a holiday weekend, Jesus says, God has come to collect tribute. Will you acknowledge him as king? Can you imagine if I preached that one on Easter Sunday? What's the big idea of your message, Pastor Dylan? You're fighting a losing war with God. Surrender. Imagine how well that one would go over. But that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, calculate your costs here. 10,000 against 20,000 sounds like pretty bad odds. You see, we like Jesus the Good Shepherd. We like Jesus the hippie on the 1970s cover of Time magazine. We like Jesus the foot washer, but we don't like Jesus the conquering king as much. Because it reminds us that the kingdom of heaven is not a democracy, it's a kingdom. And you and I are heirs of that kingdom, but we are also servants of it. And Jesus' question to the crowds is, will you bow the knee? Thankfully, Jesus didn't conquer the way the Roman Empire did, however. Bonhoeffer also said in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, the will of God is that men should defeat their enemies by loving them. Jesus conquers through giving his life instead of taking yours. And so if we want to follow Jesus, meaning if you and I want to look like Jesus, then that means we renounce the life we're entitled to the same way he renounced his life. That's what it means to be a disciple, to look the same way that the teacher looks, to sound the same way that Jesus sounds. And the teacher conquered through self-sacrifice, not through self-assertion. But he does conquer, and he is owed tribute and allegiance, and he is asking for ours. And so instead of demanding money, Jesus comes to us this morning and says, your king has come for payment, and it costs more than you ever thought it would. 
You see, God is not interested in our bank accounts, our talents, our goals. They're too little, too negligible, and too short-sighted. God will not be appeased with trifles because our king seeks a treasure that's of the highest value. Our hearts, our allegiance, our affection. He won't be persuaded with ritual acts of religion that only look like faith on the outside. And he won't accept the clean, tidy answers we say to other Christians to get them off our back. He won't permit towers to remain half-built, races to remain half-run, and love to be half-committed. That's the message that Jesus gives an assembled crowd of seekers on the big day. Abandon your balance, abandon your half-heartedness, and finally, abandon your everything. What will it cost to follow Jesus? Your everything. It could really be summed up with that one word, everything. And when I say that, some of your hearts begin to sink. Because you ask the question, I thought it was a free gift of grace. I thought that Jesus paid it all. I I thought that I was okay with God, but is he displeased with me now in some way? Let Let me remind you the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, to those same gathered crowds, he says, those who come to me, I will never turn away. You see, Jesus didn't turn away a single person from that crowd. He didn't step out into the audience and say, you're devoted enough, you aren't. You're devoted enough, you aren't. You're devoted enough, and you aren't. It was the crowd that turned aside from following Jesus. Because he sets the terms of the agreement out from the beginning, and then he takes the pen and puts it on the table. The agreement between God and man has never been in the fine print. It has always been, whosoever wills may come, but it isn't easy. It requires our all, it requires our whole hearts. And guess what? If you feel like you've fallen short, join the club who hasn't but get back up and follow Jesus. The 12 apostles were some of the most messed up people I've ever read about. They're constantly fighting with each other. They're constantly missing the point. But guess what? They had one redeeming quality. They got back up and they followed Jesus again. Jesus Jesus will never turn you away. Because grace is free. But that grace is going to lead you to places you might not want to go. Follow him anyway. Lay down your life and you will find it. If you're willing to cross the street and talk to the guy, if you're willing to offer the ride, offer the prayer, embarrass yourself, get back up, mess up, repent, move out of what you're comfortable with, then you just may find, along with Peter, you're walking on something that you didn't think was possible. What does it cost to follow Jesus? Your balance, half-heartedness, your everything. But it gives everything in return if you're willing to lose it all. I'm going to call the worship team back, and as they come, I hope that you make the question personal today. Here's the question that I hope you ask yourself. What will it cost me to follow Jesus? What will it cost you to follow Jesus? For, you see, Abraham, in the Old Testament, it cost him his home. He's told, leave everything, but he got to keep his wealth, didn't he? Abraham was one of the wealthiest men in the Old Testament. He got to keep it all. And then you come to the New Testament, and there's the rich young ruler, And Jesus comes to him and says, give everything away to the poor and come follow me. It cost him something else. And he couldn't do it. He didn't have it within him. Can you imagine the opportunity to be equal with Peter and James and John and the others, and he just didn't have the heart to follow Jesus, and now we don't even know his name. He's just the rich young ruler instead of the 13th apostle. He couldn't cross the road. 
He didn't have it. And so today, maybe God's asking, what will it cost you? For Moses, it cost him his insecurity. Go and do something you're not comfortable with. For Peter, it cost him his pride. Stop thinking you can do everything. For John, it cost the lives of all of his companions who were faithful to Jesus, and he's left alone at the end of his life. The reality here is that Jesus does not tell you specifically what it may cost you. He simply states, you must be willing to pay it all. You must be ready to renounce it all when I call for it. I'm sure you know what the Spirit of God has put on your heart today. That thing that you've elevated just a little bit too high And Jesus knows what it's like to lose something that's precious to him. Because he laid down a life that could have been long, so you and I can have a life that's eternal. What will following Jesus cost you? It's a question I'm often afraid, honestly, to ask myself. Not because I fear the answer, but because I know the answer. Everything. But if I'm willing to pay it, Jesus will give everything in return. You see, Peter was afraid of this. Jesus said this in the Gospel of Mark in a slightly different way. And Peter stands up and raises his hand, bold as Peter ever is, and says, but Lord, we've left everything. We left home and career and everything. And he goes, yes, Peter. And I tell you this, in this life, you'll receive a hundred times what you gave with affliction and in the life to come, eternal life. You see, Pastor Paul often likes to say it this way, God's paydays don't always come on Friday, but they come when they're needed. I don't know what it's going to cost you to follow Jesus, but I do know this. It will be worth it if you pay it, and you will regret forever not paying it if you try to hold on to a life that you can't keep. Jim Elliott, one of my favorite preachers of all time, and he's a missionary who gave his life for Jesus in South America, said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's what God promises you if you'll pay the cost. C.S. Lewis said in his famous work, Mere Christianity, the Christian way is different, harder and easier. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time, so much of your money, so much of your work. I want you. I've not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. (laughs) No half measures are any good. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think are innocent and all the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. And I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. What will it cost you to follow Jesus? Everything. And thank God it does. I'm going to invite you to stand now. And as we sing one last song of worship. I know that God will meet you here if you're willing. You know, I was reading recently in my own personal time, the woman with the issue of blood, she spent all her money on doctors and she can't seem to be healed. And then it comes where all of these people are swarming around and touching Jesus, but she touches Jesus and is healed. And it hit me. You see, It's not the touching that did the healing. It was the faith that did the healing. And so if you reach out to Jesus in faith today and you say, God, I just, I give it all to you. It doesn't belong to me anymore. It's all yours. I mean, this is just a normal church service, but it can turn into something supernatural if you reach out by faith. God says, I inhabit the the praises of my people. When we start to sing, God's presence literally is here. It comes down here, and it's available for you to touch. 
Like the woman with the issue of blood. If you're willing to say, God, I, it doesn't belong to me. I don't want this life. I just want to do what you want to do. I want to give myself to you. I want to be healed. I want to be seen. I want, to, I want this life to be redeemed. And I'm, tr- I'm tired of trying to collect stuff for me. I want to give it to you instead. It, it all belongs to you. And I'll follow. If you say that, then along with Peter, Jesus says to you, I tell you, even with affliction, I will give you a hundred times in this life and eternal life in the life to come. And so I'm going to invite you as the song starts to play to come forward to pray at these altars because you don't need my hands. You don't need a pastor's hands. You need not somebody to put something on you. You need to come here and put something down and you need to walk away picking up your cross because you might walk away from this altar burdened, but you will walk away joyful if you have the courage to pick up something heavy and lay down something light so that your life might be worth it. Because all the collection in the world can't buy back your soul. But Jesus has done it. And I would rather be with Jesus getting jeered at, carrying a cross, I would rather have all the pain that he offers than all the pleasure that I could accumulate in this life. Anything with Jesus is better than everything without him. And so as they sing, come, lay down what you need to and pick up your cross. Jesus, for he has said
maybe some of you need. You just need to verbalize what you're doing. And so if you would like, I'm going to invite you to repeat this little prayer after me as I pray. Father, I recommit my heart to follow you. I ask that you would give me the courage, the faith that I need to see your son and follow him all of my days. I pray this in his name. Amen. You prayed that prayer. I'd love to hear from you after service. As the worship team continues to sing, I invite you to continue to have an attitude of worship in here. If you have to go, you're free to do so. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. Be sure to listen to all our messages on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And follow us on ne-cc.org for all information and updates. Thank you. God bless. Have a great day.